All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, introducing David Stockman, former congressman, uh, former advisor to Ronald Reagan, and author of The Great Deformation, The Corruption of Capitalism in America, Peak Trump, The Undrainable Swamp, and The Fantasy of MAGA, and Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin, and How to Bring It Back. And he writes at... The Contra Corner, David Stockman's Contra Corner. That's David Stockman's Contra Corner dot com. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? Very good. Uh, you cited those subtitles in my book. I think they're kind of relevant at the moment. I they're think so. Yeah, on the brink. That was a few weeks ago, and now we've gone over it, huh? Yeah, I think so. Uh, th- this is a real calamity. Uh, we have a serious but manageable and moderate public health problem that could easily be uh, managed and extinguished, I think, in a matter of months, that's being turned into an absolute calamity by Washington. Uh, In a sense, um, the uh, big government people and the statists and the Keynesians and the interventionists and the money printers and all the rest of them think they have died and gone to heaven. They've never had an opportunity like this. Look what the Fed has been doing in the last week, what it did yesterday. Congress is on the verge of just writing a check to everybody in America. I call it the everything bailout. Two trillion dollars, you know, in in legislation that no one has even considered or thought about or assessed or analyzed, just throwing money at the economy. That's damn near 10 percent of GDP. I mean, this is, uh, you you know, you talk about uh, hysteria. Uh, The hysteria in America today is not out on the streets of New York City, where I live or any other town. It's uh, in the uh, hallways and uh, chambers of uh, Washington, the Congress and the agencies. They're they're really going hysterical, and they're going to break a lot of furniture before this is over. And uh, it's almost impossible to imagine where it's going, but it's a huge setback for any hope we have for liber- uh, personal liberty, uh, free markets, uh, fiscal uh, rectitude, uh, and uh, sound money. I mean, it's all going out the door by the minute, by the hour. This is uh, uh, a nightmare that's almost uh, impossible to imagine. I mean, we were all around in 2008 and 2009 when, uh, you know, the hysteria uh, uh, erupted then, but that was a Sunday school picnic to compared to what's going on now. Yeah, I mean, I, did I read you right that you said that they have monetized, that is the Federal Reserve, with new money, has bought $1 trillion worth of debt in the last week already? Yeah, well, in the last 10 days, give them a little more credit. Last week they bought, I think, $375 billion. This week they are buying $125 billion worth of government bonds and uh, uh, GSE, uh, guaranteed uh, uh, housing uh, securities, every single day. They're buying so much that they have to schedule it by the hour in terms of the different securities and maturities that they're buying. This is this is crazy. This is madness. Mm. And, well, now, uh, so stop that, for just a second there, Dave. I want to make sure that people understand, you know, this is the anti-war show. And um, I want the lefties to hear that here is a capitalist who hates crony capitalism and what's going on here more than any lefty. And they can hear it in your voice. Uh, why is a free market guy like you begrudge a bunch of capitalists for making a bunch of money here? Well, if they were making it honestly on the free market, I would say more power to them. If they had turned the dogs of K Street loose, the racketeers, the lobbyists uh, of K Street loose on uh, this giant bailout pork barrel that's a uh, um, emerging, uh, I would, uh, you know, denounce them until the uh, 
uh, end of the day. And, you know, that's what's happening right now. I heard this cat. And boy, it really got me hot under the collar, to tell you the truth. This morning on CNBC, the CEO of uh, Boeing uh, kind of giving an argument why he should get a huge bailout from the taxpayers of the United States from some poor guy out in Milwaukee who's driving a bus and suddenly, you know, he's not even getting his paycheck because of all this. These cats spent $100 billion buying back stock in order to goose their stock price, in order to fatten, uh, you know, their stock options, and uh, depleted their balance sheet, made all kinds of business mistakes with this Max uh, 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 airplane and all the rest of it, and now they've got the gall to come in. And this guy said, "Is you know, we wouldn't be asking for this if the markets were open to borrow." That is so much baloney. What he is saying is, if the markets were open to lend us money at 2%, I would go borrow it. But if they're not, and I had to pay an honest price, uh, given the risk that Boeing has now and the massive cash burn that they have underway because you know their customers are shut down around the world and they've made so many management mistakes, um, uh, you know, if, if he had to pay an honest price, it might be a yield of 5% or 8% or 10%. But I say, who the hell cares? That's what capitalism is about. And if you undermine it, your balance sheet, if you erode confidence in the financial markets, then you need capital, you need cash, you pay the price. Or if worse comes to worse, file for Chapter 11. You know, they would keep running Boeing, even if those uh, cats in the uh, corporate headquarters in Chicago, you know, had to be put out on the street. The, uh, uh, you know, the court appointed uh, trustees would run the company and it really wouldn't be much different. So I only pick on Boeing because it's the most outrageous, egregious example. And where are the lefties that you speak of? Where are the liberals? Where are the Democrats? I just heard Nancy Pelosi on uh, CNBC saying, well, she's almost uh, coming together uh, with this Mnuchin Secretary of Treasury. You know, this guy shouldn't be teaching 10th grade uh, geometry or 8th grade uh, geography. I mean, he's a totally incompetent boob. And uh, he's now negotiating away the entire financial future of the United States, handing it out by a hundred billion here, a hundred billion there. They're going to bail out the airlines. Those fools did the same thing, bought their stock back. The big four bought back 50 billion over the last uh, five or six years. Now they want a 50 billion bailout. The cruise lines have no balance sheet. Uh, and so therefore they were able to make a lot of money and boost their stock price. And, you know, everybody got rich and happy, but why didn't they have cash and uh, resilience on their balance sheet. Yeah, so, why didn't so, they? Let me let me ask you that. I mean, we're talking about, okay, some really incompetent CEOs here and there. That makes sense. But what explains this cluster of errors where you have the boards of directors of, sounds like all of the biggest and most powerful companies in America decided that they didn't need any savings, that they would spend all their money on stock buybacks and these kinds of things, instead of preparing for a rainy day that they had to have known was coming. Why? How? Well, there's three causes of this problem. Number one, the Fed. Number two, the Fed. Number three, the Fed. All right. Prices in the financial market, that is the price of stocks, the yield on bonds, the yield curve, you know, in terms of what a 10-year security is, uh, paying an interest versus a five-year versus a 90-day, all of that. Those are the most important sensitive prices in all of capitalism. And they have to be allowed to work on an honest basis under supply and demand in a market that is not totally manipulated, repressed, and dominated by 12 people at the Federal Reserve, the so-called uh, uh, Open Market uh, Committee, that it decides in their wisdom, you know, what the overnight rate ought to be right now. They have it at, you know, five tenths of one percent. Ridiculous. Um, and uh, the all the other madness they've come up with, including the idea that they can make the economy more prosperous by uh, inflating the price of stock and creating wealth effects and causing people to spend more and invest more and so forth. All of this is what's behind this because it's turned Wall Street into a Fed 
fueled casino. And when you get a casino going and you get jackpots of immense magnitude that uh, become irresistible to CEOs and top management and uh, boards of directors, uh, they do uh, what they're incentivized to do, which is to borrow money for nothing and use it to buy back their stock, shrink their balance sheet, uh, impair and drain the uh, you know, uh, safety uh, uh, cushions that you would build into the balance sheet of a big business in uh, a highly uh, risky world that we're in today. But they've been incentivized to do the opposite, uh, to basically strip mine their balance sheets, use up all the uh, borrowing capacity they had available, uh, use up uh, their uh, cash. Don't, you know, they didn't create reserves and uh, they didn't uh, create a capital structure that might cost a little more and reduce their earnings, but allow them uh, to survive the kind of uh, uh, shock, short run shock that we're having at the present time. So uh, to summarize, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, it's the falsification of every kind of financial price there is. It's the massive incentive for the corporate leadership of America uh, to uh, become totally short-term stock price oriented. I call it this, the cult of the Dow, Dow uh, you know, industrials. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really ruining everything. And now Congress thinks that they have to, you know, sight on scene practically throw $2 trillion at the economy so that this Dow index and the S&P 500 don't keep going down. Well, that's no way to run a country. Who the hell cares where the Dow is, okay? Uh, that's a speculator's index anyway. This isn't a real stock market anymore. It's just one giant casino. And yet these people are basically uh, putting everybody in America in harm's way. Future taxpayers for decades and decades and decades to come are going to service this enormous debt uh, that's being done out of sheer hysteria, panic, and, um, you know, madness, this, this is, it, it, it's a madness. It's, it's almost like there's something in the water down there that turns the, has turned these people uh, into uh, to really uh, loony, lunatics. Mm. Well, and that's part of being a politician is you don't have to understand economics at all. You just have to react when businessmen say, give us some free money. And so uh, that's what yeah, they're doing. Yeah. And I think you, it was you that wrote that it was it was Mnuchin was the guy that ran Sears Roebuck into the ground in this exact same manner. And now he's the guy in charge of saving everybody from his exact same mistake. Yeah, it's even worse. Even worse. Mnuchin was kind of a no count flunky at uh, Goldman Sachs. I don't know whether they uh, got rid of him or he wandered off. But in the last crisis, he got lucky, and with a couple of other people, they bought a no-count, down-in-the-mouth, bankrupt SNL called IndyMac that had no reason to exist. It could have easily been liquidated, and share uh, uh, depositors paid off, and the losses incurred. That's what deposit insurance is about. But no, Washington had to bail out with billions of dollars worth of uh, uh infusions of capital into IndyMac, uh, and uh, he bought it, and he and his uh, colleagues, after a couple of years, walked away with several billion dollars worth of profit. So we have a Secretary of Treasury uh, to who is the beneficiary of the last bailout mania, uh, who, uh, you know, basically ended up with a windfall of billions, he and his investors, that never, ever should have happened. And so how do you expect this guy to have any perspective? Uh, he's not even a Republican. I mean, he's a Wall Street Democrat. It's, he's one of these uh, Jim Cramer, whatever it takes. The whole world, at least the United States and the taxpayers and the government and the balance sheet of Uncle Sam, all the rest of it, the Fed is here to make the stock market keep going up every day. That's, yep. that's their view. And he comes right out of that tradition, and it is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, the worst thing is, this is a so-called Republican administration. This is the second time in this century that Republican administrations have basically set aside every semblance of fiscal, uh, you know, uh, sanity, uh, have basically... Uh, 
you know, uh, ash canned uh, sound money and encouraged the Fed to go uh, off the deep end and have buried the country in debt because they fail to understand how markets are supposed to work and how financial discipline is so essential if you're going to have a healthy, balanced, sustainable economy. And obviously, when you bail out everything, you create moral hazard in capital letters uh, on steroids. And that's what they're doing now. I mean, after everybody gets bailed out, including these utterly irresponsible people at Boeing, uh, after they get bailed out, what future board or uh, set of officers is going to worry about, uh, you know, uh, too much risk on their balance sheet, uh, not enough uh, ballast, not enough, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, fallback uh, uh, capacity, uh, financial uh, flexibility right. if they're going to get bailed out anyway. Yeah, that's what they called the the Greenspan put before, right? When that one investment bank was going to fail, and he went and propped it up, and every other investment bank, this is what, in the late 90s, every other investment bank said, oh, good, Greenspan's going to back us up, we can speculate on whatever we want, and we won't ever have to worry about going out of business. Well, it's not, yeah, but the Greenspan put was bad enough, and it you know, and it happened with long-term capital in 1998, and it's only grown from there. But now what you have is a Washington put. The whole system down there, Democrats, Republicans, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury Department, the whole K Street army of lobbyists are all in the business of marshalling the uh, resources of the central bank and the U.S. Treasury to bail out themselves and uh, their constituencies and, you know, their contributors uh, whenever uh, trouble uh, appears on the horizon. So, I, you know, I don't see how capitalism continues to function in, in this kind of system. I truly don't. Yeah, well, so, I mean, that's the real point, right? I mean, if you, I know this is a bad way to take the temperature but if you look at twitter the consensus on from everyone to the left of me say is capitalism has failed and once this yeah. crisis is over we're gonna have to have an entirely new economy which i guess will mean even more power to washington dc and more power to bureaucrats because obviously the capitalists don't know how to run an economy we need someone to command and control it to prevent it from being such a disaster like this yeah, but all you have to do is listening, listen to a knucklehead like uh, Mnuchin for about a minute or Nancy Pelosi or Chuckle Schumer or Trump, and you realize that these people are so incompetent that when they do take control of everything, which they're doing now, they're going to make a royal catastrophic mess of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, the country will go through a lot of traumas, uh, a lot of dislocations, a lot of unnecessary pain. But maybe, uh, you know, the silver lining that you can hope for is that it, it will be demonstrated that this is so wrong uh, and uh, so uh, uh, ineffective as approach uh, to running an economy that we get a, a severe political reaction backlash and we go back to some more uh, sensible, um, you know, policies. But yep. uh, so, you know, they're given they're being given, I guess, a, a very long length of rope to hang themselves. And it's only and they will. There's no doubt about it. Fed's already done that. I think, mean, you know, they came out with these guns blaring Monday and the market you know, puked all over them. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're going to hang themselves. The question is, uh, the, the unfortunate part is everybody else is going to have to suffer uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. Well, but now what about the uh, argument that I'm sure they would make that this isn't their fault? The bubble would have gone on for another little while. They might have saved up some money by the time it popped. But there's a global pandemic that's inducing this clamp down and this, you know, new bear market. And so it's what are we going to do if the all the most powerful co uh, companies in our country all fall apart and completely destroy the economy? This is an emergency, David, a real one. Well, they're not going to all fall apart. Um, you know, this is a supply side shock. Uh, it's happening on both sides of the equation. Production is falling. Incomes are falling. Spending is falling. 
you know, the idea that um, this is like some kind of inexorable whirlpool, uh, you know, where everything gets sucked down the drain and it can't be stopped is totally wrong. That's the Keynesian predicate that if the government doesn't intervene when you have a economic dislocation like this, capitalism will just uh, collapse on its own uh, weight and eat itself alive and destroy everything in sight. That's the myth of the Great Depression. We don't have time to talk about that now, but it wasn't capitalism that failed. It was central banks and uh, governments and uh, war finance and so forth that failed uh, and created the Great Depression. But my point is capitalism has tremendous powers of rejuvenation. And as soon as this public health emergency and hysteria dials down and eventually dissipates, uh, people will go back to work, restaurants will open, hotels will reopen, the airlines will start flying, production will commence, incomes will be produced, people will start spending again. It's not going down a black hole. Um, and if there are some, uh, you know, bankruptcies along the way, uh, that's what the uh, Chapter 11 system is designed uh, to handle. Well, why don't you uh, explain that a little bit for those of us who've only had jobs and not run corporations before? What does it mean if my corporation goes bankrupt and goes to Chapter 11? All my people are fired and go homeless and all of my yeah, capital equipment to- rots on a pile somewhere? Now, Chapter 11 is actually pretty soft on uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, debtor, uh, the filer, uh, and basically their requirement to pay all of their creditors stops on a dime. It's frozen. Uh, bankrupt, uh, bankruptcy courts appoint trustees. They take over. Uh, they uh, go out and are able to get what's called uh, a dip loan, which is uh, made senior by the courts to everything else the company owes. That money is used to fund operations. And uh, if there's demand for the service or uh, the product uh, of, uh, of the company in Chapter 11, uh, it gets serviced. Uh, the, the losers in Chapter 11 are the stockholders who get wiped out, and that's what capitalism is about. You know, the stock market is a risky place. It's about time people learn that. And the uh, uh, lenders who probably uh, didn't fully uh, compute uh, the risk that they were taking, and so they get a haircut. You know, if they're senior, maybe they lose 30 cents on the dollar. If they're subordinated way down at the bottom of the capital structure, maybe they lose 80 cents. So what? Uh, I think it's good uh, for the bond markets and the uh, loan markets uh, uh, to uh, be reminded that there's risk and that uh, they need to, their job is to um, fully assess the risks of every uh, creditor that they, uh, uh, every borrower that uh, comes to their window. So the key point, though, is this: the loss in Chapter 11 happens on the financial side. It doesn't mean that every employee gets uh, laid off or loses his job or his income. If there is a viable business there, the heart of the viable business operates, uh, and the uh, financial crud uh, and rot that was built up uh, gets, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, purged away. Now, uh, you can't have the whole country, uh, obviously, in Chapter 11 at the same time, but uh, the point is, when they start telling you that everything's going down a black hole, that's not rational, uh, all-in view. That's not uh, a honest, cap, uh, honest economic assessment. That's basically creditors and stockholders whining that, uh, you know, they're going to uh, take a loss and uh, we shouldn't listen to them. Hold on just one second. Be right back. So you're constantly buying things from Amazon.com. Well, that makes sense. They bring it right to your house. So what you do, though, is click through from the link in the right hand margin at ScottHorton.org and I'll get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. Won't cost you a thing. Nice little way to help support the show. Again, that's uh, right there in the margin at ScottHorton.org. Hey, I'll check it out. The Libertarian Institute, that's me and my friends, have published three great books this year. First is No Quarter, The Ravings of William Norman Grigg. He was the best one of us. Now he's gone, but this great collection is a truly fitting legacy for his fight for freedom. I know you'll love it. 
Then there's Coming to Palestine by the great Sheldon Richman. It's a collection of 40 important essays he's written over the years about the truth behind the Israel-Palestine conflict. You'll learn so much and highly value this definitive libertarian take on the dispossession of the Palestinians and the reality of their brutal occupation. And last but not least is the great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019. Interview transcripts of all of my interviews of The Good Doctor over the years on all the wars, money, taxes, the police state, and more. So how do you like that? Pretty good, right? Find them all at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. You need stickers for your band or your business? Well, Rick and the guys over at thebumpersticker.com have got you covered. Great work, great prices, sticky things with things printed on them. Whatever you need, thebumpersticker.com will get it done right for you. Thebumpersticker.com. All right, now, so, but if the Fed's easy money policy in the 90s led to the popping of the terrible bubble in 99 and 2000, and then the Fed's easy money policies in the 2000s led to the terrible housing crisis and bubble pop in 2008 and 9 there, um, and then now the, all the QE 1 through 10 or whatever it is, uh, supposedly to fix that crisis has helped generate the bubbles, the bubble that's now being popped by this virus. But now, and you're describing this reaction as, I don't know, two, three or 10 times the overreaction from last time. What does that mean they're setting us up for in terms of distortions in the market going forward here? Well, in the first case, it's a classic case of, uh, you know, uh, well, what uh, Einstein said, uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result uh, is uh, a pretty good indicator of insanity, right? Um, and that's what they're doing, but they're not just doing it over and over. They're doubling down and tripling down. But uh, this may be the last rodeo. In other words, they have gone so far off the deep end that uh, there is going to be so much broken furniture in the wake of this. There's going to be so much political debate and recrimination that maybe finally, um, you know, the central bank uh, is going to have to uh, uh, become accountable and uh, some big uh, uh, statutory uh, changes uh, possibly can be made. Um, this, this is just... Uh, uh, you know, this is the, kind of the last straw, I'd say. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this then. People are saying, for example, Pat Buchanan is saying, well, this is the end of the globalist project and the return of the nation state. Even in Germany, Angela Merkel is not taking charge of the European response to the virus. She's taken control of the German response to the virus and every other nation for himself. And, of course, you have all the supply lines and chains between here and China that especially more right-leaning nationalists are saying must be changed, right? Uh, Tucker Carlson says, we let the Chinese make all our medicine, and now we're completely dependent on them for our medicine, and they can threaten to cut us off, which they actually threaten to cut us off. Um, I wonder if you think that the whole project of the internationalization of capitalism since you know the end of the Cold War is now in real jeopardy. Well, I think the um, the false exaggerated part of it is because this wasn't sort of natural free market capitalism at work. The reason so much of the U.S. economy, including medical supplies and equipment and, you know, uh, surgical gowns and all the rest of it was offshore, is that the fools in the Eccles building insisted on inflating the U.S. economy at 2% a year or better, thereby driving up the dollar cost of every factory in America at a time when China was draining its rice paddies of cheap labor and, um, you know, generating uh, an export economy uh, because uh, uh, America was pricing itself uh, out of the world market. We really should have had, since Greenspan took over in late 87, that was right before, you know, uh, Mr. Deng said to, to be rich is glorious, and China went from the Mao policies of power coming from the end of a gun to uh, uh, Deng's policy of uh, communist rule coming from the end of a printing press, um, 
from that point forward, the U.S. economy under a uh, honest regime of sound money and market free markets would have de deflated. We would have reduced the build up costs artificially build up costs that we had from the great inflation of the late 60s and 70s and early 80s, that would have been wrung out of our economy and the dollar cost of producing here would have not been nearly as uh, disadvantageous as uh, it became uh, over the 90s and especially during the first decade of the 2000s. So this uh, excess uh, off, uh, offshoring and these very fragile supply chains that were created and anchored in China are not really uh, natural free market economics. Some of it would have happened, but a lot of it wouldn't uh, in a regime of sound money and uh, honest free markets. So I think that part of it is going to be rolled back but on the other hand, if the uh, central bank doesn't allow, um, you know, the pricing system to work in the financial uh, uh, markets, you know, I'm not sure how much headway we're really going to make and we're going to end up with Trumpian policies instead. In other words, there's two ways to fix this. One is with honest money and free uh, trade and free markets. The other is with Trumpian protectionism and cheap money and more central bank uh, distortion of the whole financial system and uh, the uh, domestic uh, cost, uh, price, uh, and wage levels. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think uh, we're heading more for the Trumpian protectionist solution, which is even worse uh, than what we have now, than for the correct solution, uh, which is uh, hard money, uh, and uh, free markets. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, every place you turn right now, uh, we're heading in the wrong direction. There's no, you know, there's no uh, way around it. <laughs> you know, you have to face uh, the reality. This, this is pretty grim. And, uh, you know, millions of innocent people who just want to make a living and improve their circumstances in life and maybe even uh, save a little money and or take a risk and build a business or invent something, uh, you know, they're all going to be stymied by uh, this uh, terrible uh, takeover of the economy by the fiscal and monetary authorities and all of the uh, larcenists uh, uh, <laughs> in the imperial city, as I call it. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what about the warfare state? On one hand, we just can't afford to keep killing Arabs at this rate. But on the other hand, what a great jobs program. Maybe we'll conscript some men and bring the unemployment rate down, and uh, we'll funnel some more money into Lockheed and make things seem yeah. like they're productive and, and kill even more yeah. innocent people over there. What do you think? Well, you know, there may be one silver lining in this god-awful, catastrophic mess that we're facing, and that is, I think, the shock of the economy going down. I mean, we're going to have next week, you know, there's going to be like a million, two million people filing for unemployment, just numbers people never seen before that'll get magnified and, you know, uh, almost put into hysterical headlines and CNBC uh, crawlers across the bottom of the screen, uh, it's going to create such a shock and such a dissonance with all of the boasting that Trump was doing about the greatest economy in ever, which was, ever, which was always uh, complete baloney, that I think he's finished. And uh, the Democrats, even if they put up, uh, you know, uh, uh, even if they put up Joe, uh, are going to take over and they're going to face a fiscal crisis of horrendous uh, uh, magnitude. And uh, when push comes to shove, it's more likely they'll hang on to more of the welfare and less of the warfare. And uh, whether, you know, um, uh, wh whether they would like uh, to become uh, more rational about foreign policy and more non-interventionist or not, I think they'll be forced to because uh, they'll be out of money. Uh, they're going to be out of money. There's nothing probably better to stop the war machine at this point than a democratic government that's out of money. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where we'll be in 2021. 
Well, I wonder, you know, I mean, uh, that's the story of post-World War II England, right? Was that the people, the voters of England fired Churchill. Great job on uh, Hitler and everything there. But now you get out and they brought in, what, Heath, right? To save the welfare state at the expense yeah. of the empire. But, yeah. but uh, rewind just a few years before that, America was completely broke. And FDR's idea was... Well, what we'll do is we'll conscript an army of 16 million men and we'll send them off to fight. And that'll bring our unemployment rate down and it'll be, you know, it'll create all this demand for uh, industrial capacity and all these things. And it'll be great for at least disguising the pain of the Depression um, until well, everybody gets home though, and can get back to work. The difference, though, Scott, is that in the 30s, even after the New Deal, which, uh, of course, you know, we, we like to... Uh, uh, you know, beat upon as uh, a terrible thing, and it was. I mean, it, it totally backfired. It didn't do any good. But it didn't build up that much debt, surprisingly. The debt of the United States relative to GDP was like 3% uh, when the Great uh, when the, uh, Great Depression started, the New Deal was launched. And by the eve of World War One, by the eve of Pearl Harbor, you know, I, I doubt it was much more than 10%. I've written a lot about this in the past. So we had a big clean balance sheet that could be used to fund uh, a massive uh, sudden increase in the warfare state to take on the Nazi and the, and the Japanese uh, for better or worse. That's not the case today. The case today is, you know, by the end of uh, this year, we're going to have 24, 25 trillion of debt with two or three trillion a year built in. Uh, there is, you know, they're, they're in fiscal handcuffs. And it's not likely that the Fed can print enough money to buy up all this debt. I think, that, you know, there's a risk here that finally uh, they've gone so far that the bond vigilantes will uh, awake from their uh, slumber, their 30-year uh, nap. And uh, if the, uh, you know, bond market ever begins to uh, roll over and... Uh, People start selling bonds because they're afraid of where we're going. Uh, you know, uh, then uh, that will be, uh, you know, that that will be uh, a game, a showstopper, because mm -hmm. uh, then uh, interest rates will soar and everything uh, will uh, stop in terms of this, you know, fiscal uh, nonsense that's going on right now. And the biggest, when Bush comes to shove. You know, they'll cut the military sooner than they'll cut food stamps. I really think that's the case. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that, but yeah. Well, you know, you know, I would bet on that at yeah. the end of the day. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so now the, the liberals, they have this modern monetary theory. I'm sure you've seen, I think there's even a bill that has been introduced to order the treasury to mint two platinum coins and then yeah. just carve into them that they are yeah. each worth each a trillion dollars. Yeah. And so that the government can then spend that money on helping the poor, whatever. I guess the idea is if they're going to send us a thousand bucks each, why not send us a hundred thousand yeah, bucks 10, each? Why not a hundred thousand? Make everybody rich. Yeah. I mean, it's so absurd that I, you can't even critique it because you feel embarrassed, like you're arguing with a third grader or something, you know? Uh, what we, in terms of modern monetary theory, we more or less have it now. They're printing on limited amounts of money. They're buying up the debt. The only difference is they go through the fiction of buying the debt, that is the, tra the uh, Fed, uh, from the 23 dealers in the secondary market rather than buying it from the Treasury directly. But what the hell's the difference? The Treasury puts it out to, at 10 this morning, borrows some more money, and at 2 o'clock, this afternoon, the treasury, uh, the Fed buys it back from the dealers. They might as well save the, uh, you know, the skim that the dealers got and sold it to the Treasury at ten uh, to the Fed at 10 a.m. this morning, and that would be modern monetary theory in practice. So, we're almost there. The this stupid trillion-dollar coin is just a way of saying, you know, we can raise the debt ceiling uh, without uh, having any political consequences. I, I, you know, it's it's kind of a sideshow. It's a fiction. The real danger is that markets need to set the price of every kind of security, every kind of debt, long, short, in between high risk, low risk, government, junk bonds, uh, corporates, Boeing. It needs to be set through price discovery at a 
you know, level playing field of supply and demand and not by the Federal Reserve in Washington. And uh, we're, uh, you know, we're 180 degrees away from that. Uh, and that's uh, the real calamity that's underway at the present time. Yeah. Uh, and of course, more and more people are, because after all, uh, you know, never mind all your nuance about, uh, you know, a free market or a gold standard or this and that. We have a Fed. We have a massive regulatory state. We have all these things. But the whole thing, our system is called capitalism. And so from the point of view of everyone to the left, they're just moving further and further to the left because every bit of what's going wrong here is the fault of capitalism and capitalists. And who could deny it? Yeah, and the thing is, we're doing de facto socialism right now. I call it ersatz socialism, which means, you know, sort of ad hoc. Um, but, you know, that when you bail out everybody in sight, uh, when you have a soup line of corporate uh, mendicants uh, from one coast to the other, uh, well, that's socialism, okay? That's not, uh, that's not capitalism. That's not... Um, supply and demand at work. That's not risk and reward. That's not uh, succeeding or failing on your own uh, petard, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, that, and so then the Republicans get themselves all worked up into a rhetorical frenzy about we have to stop Bernie Sanders and the uh, socialist left in the Democratic Party I mean, you know, greater hypocrisy has never been exhibited in Washington, to my knowledge. Yeah, and of course, everyone on the left can see that. That Yeah, socialism for giant corporations is fine. They get to privatize all their profits and socialize all their costs. But the old lady who needs help paying her medical bills, screw her. Yeah. Well, they're doing more. This uh, nincompoop uh, Mnuchin and Trump himself, you know, they're doing more to undermine the idea of capitalism than any Bernie Sanders could do in a month of Sundays, okay? Yeah. Um, well, so let me ask you this, and I know you're not an epidemiologist, but I wonder how you, you know, balance in your imagination here the cost of this clampdown and the deliberate, you know, kind of introduction of a Great Depression um, in order to try to stop this contagion uh, versus the suffering we'd all have to go through, the Great Depression we'd probably all have to go through if we did nothing and, and let the virus spread and kill that many more people and these kinds of things. Is there a balance well, point in there that you, you know, got your yeah, finger on there? Yeah, I don't think you have to go that far. First of all, it's you, you have to understand that this isn't some kind of uh, virus spreading, uh, you know, in some sci-fi sci uh, movie faction uh, fashion uh, uh, in a unstoppable way. What what we have is perception. That is, when you start testing, you get more cases, and the more panic you get about the testing, the more testing you do, the more cases you get. It looks like there's a curve going out of sight, but it. You know, it's not uh, the disease that's happening, uh, it's the reporting. Um, and so, therefore, I think it's pretty clear that uh, social distancing, shutting down big uh, public events and sports stadiums and so forth is not the end of the world, but it will uh, burn out uh, in a matter of weeks. It has in most places around the world. I think it will here as well. And we're not going into a Great Depression. Uh, this is a service economy, and the minute someone uh, feels they can open uh, their restaurant, they're going to do it. <laughs> and uh, their flower shop and their nail uh, polish shop and, and all the rest of it. We're going to go back uh, to production, I think, quite rapidly. And I will give Trump uh, some credit, and he's being crucified by CNN uh, for it, but saying we got to get... Uh, the economy reopened uh, as quickly as we can. And once it reopens, then we'll find out that capitalism doesn't have a death, death wish. There's not a black hole. There are not certain inexorable uh, forces that <laughs> circle the drain and uh, disappear. This is a lot of nonsense. Uh, production will start. Incomes will resume. Spending will pick up. 
But the idea that the United States can't go for five or six months of a, let's call it economic uh, spring vacation uh, without calamity is just wrong. We have a social safety net in this country that in normal times costs a billion dollars a year, trillion dollars a year, excuse me. That's what Medicaid and food stamps and uh, cash assistance and, and all the rest of it provides. Uh, and in these circumstances, uh, there's going to be no humanitarian crisis. Uh, unemployment benefits are automatic, 26 weeks. People will get them. Uh, if they have to, uh, you know, uh, go to Medicaid and food stamps and the other benefits, they will. Uh, so uh, there, there is a bottom to this. Uh, there are uh, shock absorbers built into the system. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's only a matter of months before I think this will pass, just like it did in China. And, you know, the interesting thing is just uh, when people get all uh, worked up about, uh, you know, some kind of uh, horrible plague uh, inexorably taking down everything, uh, I would note that today, if you look at the case of the United States, 46,000, uh, right now, because we're beginning to test rapidly, so the number's going up rapidly. That's not because the uh, number of infections is going up. It's because the testing reporting is happening. But it's still one hundredth of one percent of the population. That's about what China uh, has in terms of the 83,000 uh, cases they've had. That's about one hundredth of one percent. Um, if you go to uh, Italy, it's one-tenth of one percent for some reason, partly because it's an older population. But here's the interesting one. If you go to J uh, uh, Japan, which is the oldest population on Earth, so it should be the most vulnerable, it's got the highest rate of smoking on Earth, and this is a respiratory problem. So they should be specially vulnerable. But there's only about 1,100 cases in China, which, or I mean in Japan, which means that their infection rate against the population is 1,000th of 1%. So 1,000th in um, Japan. What's the explanation for that, do you think? Uh, I've been trying to figure out. Well, one, they haven't shut down Japan. I I'm just citing some facts, but I'm, I'm telling you, that's why you can't assume this is like some kind of mathematical uh, germ that's going to, uh, you know, take everything down in a uh, uh, unstoppable, inexorable fashion. Because if you look around the world, that clearly uh, hasn't happened now. Um, you know, you heard silly things like they don't shake hands in Japan, they bow. OK, so uh, maybe there's less contact. I don't know. But the point is, there's empirical evidence. Japan had its first case long before we did or South Korea did. Uh, there's empirical evidence that populations around the world have responded dramatically differently in terms of the infection rate. And that's the only thing that counts to this, number one. And second, no matter which country you look at, Italy at one-tenth of one percent of their 60 million people, uh, or Japan at one-thousandth of a percent of their 126 million people, it's a small fraction uh, uh, of people that uh, are infected uh, and uh, obviously a very much smaller uh, mortality rate among that. I'm not dismissing it or saying it should be ignored, but uh, it, this isn't the Black Plague that's taking down 25% yeah. of the population or something like that, and we, we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, it's the irony of viruses is the more dangerous they are, the faster they burn themselves out. It's yeah. the, the viruses like the cold that are really successful that don't kill you but are good at spreading themselves. In right. that way. So and, and then usually the most dangerous ones end up evolving or devolving to become less dangerous. Uh, usually, you know, yeah, somewhat uh, quickly. But... Herd, herd immunity is developing all the rest of it. Right. There are a lot of good epidemiologists around uh, who, uh, you know, dissent from the mainstream view of this, which is being amplified and, uh, you know, uh, drummed in uh, relentlessly by CNN and the Washington Post and the New York Times and all the rest of it, the establishment media, I, I think, you hate to say this, but kind of relishes this kind of crisis because it means the government should be doing more 
and Trump has failed again. Okay? Yeah. Well, this but all thing- that aside, you know, I decided back in January that, you know, because I don't watch TV anyway, ever since Hillary Clinton ran for president, I just can't deal. So, um, and then on, I got all these other, I got to keep up with the wars and all this stuff. So in terms of the germ, I've just been reading the Wall Street Journal. And because I figured their audience matters, right? Unlike us plebeians out here in the world, um, these are the owners of America, and they need to know. And and I'm not talking about the editorial page either. Forget them, but just the yeah. hard news section of the Wall Street Journal. And they've been saying, "Hey, business owners, get your act together. This is a big deal. We're going to need a real clamp down." And it seems like you know the biggest businesses in America, they're going along with this because they're getting the same briefing that the government's getting. That we're better off clamping down for the short term now than suffering through the long term consequences of not reacting harshly enough on this. What do you think of that? Well, you know, it's, I think you can't make a blanket statement. Um, I think a lot of businesses that develop, that are dependent, like restaurants and so forth, uh, airlines on big crowds, uh are well advised to be shutting down for the duration. Mm. But, uh, you know, it seems like uh, after a uh, period of a few weeks here, businesses that can come up with a way to, you know, put everybody in masks who's working or keep them distanced uh, should be allowed to restart if they can do it in a safe manner. And I think actually people are going to be coming up with ways to do it. Uh, Business doesn't want to sit at home uh, watching Netflix. You know, it wants to produce. It wants to generate cash flow. It wants to pay its bills. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we we shouldn't go overboard with pessimism here. Um, There's going to be a growing crescendo of demand to reopen the economy, and people will find uh, safer uh, ways to do it. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. David Stockman, the best guy you'll ever see on any of these financial channels like CNBC and so forth. Um, And by the way, I just love it when you say anti-war stuff to them and make all their brains explode. It's just hilarious (laughs) every time. Um, and, And I could mention... To people, please check out David's archives at antiwar.com. He is just as good uh, at hating the wars as me or Romando have ever been, and, and just as good as he is on the economy. He is on the wars, too. And that includes the minutia, debunking the fake sarin gas attacks in Syria and all the rest. Just great stuff always from you, David, and I appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, you guys. David Stockman. That's David Stockman's Contra Corner. Dot com and again the books are the great deformation peak trump and trumped a nation on the brink of ruin and how to bring it back the scott horton show and anti-war radio can be heard on kpfk 90.7 fm in la apsradio.com antiwar.com scotthorton.org and libertarianinstitute.org